Hey there, and welcome to the Apartment Building Investing Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Blanc. I'm super excited that you're here. So I want to make sure you guys know Dealmaker Live is in Dallas, July 26, 27. And uh, anyone who's everyone who's anyone is going to be there. It's going to be a large multifamily conference. Uh, we have Robert Helms speaking there. Uh, the real estate guy is going to be. We've got Joe Fairless. We have Michael Becker, Adam Adams, Corey Peterson, Matt Faircloth, and many others are going to be there. And if you're a passive investor, you need to be there. If you're a syndicator, you need to be there. If if you're a capital raiser, you're going to be there. Or even interested in multifamily, you need to be there. Go to the michaelblank.com forward slash event to grab your tickets and make sure you don't miss this. All right, so today on the show, we have Paul Moore, best-selling author, uh, podcaster, and investor, and uh, second time he's been on the show, really great guy. And we're gonna t just hammer home kind of the ideas around passive investing. Is active investing the right thing, or is passive investing maybe a little bit more? And in that, we talk about the powerful commercial value formula. Why is it that commercial real estate is so much more powerful than its residential counterpart? We go through some examples of, of that as well and how relatively easy it is to create unbelievable amount of value in commercial real estate where it almost seems effortless. Uh, we'll also talk about different kinds of asset classes and we got multifamily, self-storage, mobile home parks. What are some of the pros and cons? We talk about some of the tax uh, benefits of multifamily investing or commercial real estate in general. So really looking at all of the uh, all of the points uh, from a passive investment standpoint. If you're an active investor, really pay attention because this gives you insight into the mindset of the passive investors so that you know how to approach them to raise money for your deal. So without any further ado, let's get an episode with Paul Moore. Here we go. Paul, welcome back to the show. It's so great to have you here again. Michael, I'm thrilled to be here. Thanks for having me on again. This is, uh, this is great. Uh, it's great to have you back on, on here. And uh, there's so many things that have happened on your front. Uh, you've you've adjusted some of your investing, and you're just really passionate about, you know, helping especially passive investors kind of see the light of of day, and and how amazing commercial real estate is in, as an investment. So I want to talk kind of to the passive investors today. I also want to talk to people who thought might they might have been active investors and want to do active investing, and maybe that's not the best path for them. Maybe the best path is actually to to passively invest, and the goal is actually exactly the same. Um, so there's a couple of considerations, Paul. One is if, if I'm a high income earner, I'm a doctor, dentist, an attorney, uh, and I have a great income, but one of the things I don't have is, is a lot of time. What, and what, is, you know, what are my alternatives here? When I'm investing my money and I'm looking for a consistent return and I'm looking for an attractive risk profile and I'm really trying to minimize my, my taxes and I'm like, man, December of last year was really brutal. The stock market really took a dive. 2018 in general was kind of brutal. I don't know about this, you know? I mean, what, yeah. are, what are some of the thoughts that are they're going, uh, some advice that you have or considerations for something like that? Well, the way I see it is if you're a passive investor, you've got, uh, you've got two ends of the spectrum here. On one end of the spectrum, you've got stocks, bonds, mutual funds, and the like. Now, they're great because they have a very long track record of growth and they have great liquidity. I mean, if you want to cash it in anytime you want, you can cash it in. And that's great on that end of the spectrum. The problem with these though, is that they might go, they're not really predictable. They're not really stable. They might go up and down based on a CEO scandal or war in the Middle East or the whims on what's going on on Wall Street. So you can't really perfectly predict how they're going to behave. Now at the other end of the spectrum, you've got things like commercial real estate, which is a passive investment that is not at all liquid. And in fact, we could even say it has a liquidity tax. But what you're trading for that lack of liquidity is you're trading, you're getting stability, predictability, a long-term demographic time horizon. You can look down the road and see things like multifamily are going to be great investments for, you know, likely the next hundred years. And so, you can get something that you couldn't get in stock and bond investing. You know, do you remember the Nifty 50? It's before our time, Michael, but the Nifty 50 were 50 stocks in the 1960s. They said nothing could topple these. You know, things like Xerox and Kodak and other, you know, General Electric. You know, stocks they say could never go down. Nothing could harm these. Well, we all know that that's just not true. But um, so, 
you know, I, I love commercial real estate investing. And I, one of the reasons I love it is because, you know, the value is based on something different than residential and very different from stocks as well as we'll probably get into. Yeah. So this is a kind of a, let's talk about people. And, and, and I know many of these, they're, they're passive investors, uh, but they want to get into the game. And so they kind of go into the realm of active investor. Active investor means that they're actually looking for deals and yeah. they're, you know, they're <clears throat> typically, maybe they're late when a landlord or want to flip some houses they, because they want to accomplish that. They want to become a real estate investor, get income from, from real estate investor. But Give me some examples of, in some instances, it may actually not be such a great idea for everyone, and it might actually be better just to, be, to stay a passive investor. You know, a lot of times I talk to people who are beating their head against the wall, and they're spending every waking moment, you know, evenings and weekends and even vacations trying to, you know, find that perfect house to flip or swing a hammer if they've got one. But Michael, you're, uh, you and I are both entrepreneurs for a long time, and we know that things cost much more than you plan, they take twice as long as you plan, and they're usually less profitable than people plan for. And so I was on HGTV's House Hunters, I know about HGTV, and I can tell you that, you know, the real world is not like HGTV, and most people flipping houses find that it's much harder, especially now that there are so, so many people competing in the space. It's much harder to find a good deal. It's much harder to be profitable. Now, another thing people want to do is they want to amass a single family home portfolio. And I usually find that when people hit five or 10, they start realizing this is harder than I thought. I talked to an oral surgeon the other day, his wife's an orthodontist in the Pacific Northwest, great guy. And he said, you know, I'm up to four single family rentals now and I'm like I'm trying to figure out who why my painter didn't show up between oral surgery appointments I can't do this I was gonna get 20 and retire and there's no way I can do 20 I talked to another guy in Fargo who has 320 he's made it Michael he's actually got 320 single family and small multifamily and he said I hate my life he said I've got a whole team of people to handle this stuff but I still don't have any time for my family and there's no way I can continue to do this. I'm selling off most of my portfolio and going passive. And that was in October. I talked to him in April uh, this month and he said, hey, I've sold off two thirds of it. I'm already happier and I'm going more passive. I asked these people this, why work harder than you need to, to make less than you could? That's a good point. I mean, let's explore that. So if, if not that, Paul, then what else is there? Well, I mean, so, I mean, the, the, there, I mean, and there are people who make it. I mean, we know of, you know, there, there is a company in Memphis, you know, you're very familiar with Memphis that has a whole lot of single families that they manage and they seem to have made it. They've got a whole lot of investors, but, um, uh, you know, I think that is, I think people can do it. It's just, I haven't run into hardly anybody who has been able to pull this off and hardly anybody that have been happy doing it. There's so much more economy of scale going with large scale multifamily like you and I invest in and other asset classes like self storage, mobile home parks, et cetera. And the commercial value formula is powerful. You don't get that with residential. What do you mean by that? What do you mean? Yeah. Can you expound a little bit on, on, on that? The commercial value formula? Yeah. Yeah, so in you know you may be Chip and Joanna Gaines Jr. You may be able to take that five hundred thousand dollar house and add it, you know, build out the basement, build out the attic, add a room on, beautify everything, and turn it into a million dollar house. But if you're in a half a million dollar neighborhood, Michael, you know, you're probably not going to get that million dollars out of it when you sell it. We've all seen this. Now. That's residential because they're based on comps. They're based on comparable properties. The value formula in commercial real estate is entirely different. It's the value equals the income divided by the rate of return. Also, you can say the value is the net operating income divided by the cap rate or the capitalization rate. Now, the cap rate is typically, you know, it's, it's the expected rate of return for that type of asset in that geography at that time. Well, the cap rate had been 8 to 10% historically, and now we all know it's running in the 4 to 7% range typically, and that means investor expectations have gone to the point where they're willing to over or pay much more 
than they used to, in some cases overpay for assets, and they're willing to accept a lower rate of return. Now, this value formula means you can force appreciation. There's a lot of ways to do that, but it's not based on comps. You can get a commercial real estate property, and if you've got the property, there are things you can do to drive that numerator up, that's the income, and sometimes you can even compress the denominator, the cap rate, and that's a powerful way to drive increased income and value to the owners and investors. All right, so can you maybe provide an example of, of why this commercial value formula is so much more powerful than, than the, re the residential side? Yeah, you bet. You know, Jeff Bezos, it's well known, he removed the uh, lights from all the vending machines in Amazon properties around the, uh, of the America. And the reason he did that is he said, well, it's, it's a cost of a light bulb. It's the cost of electricity. It's the cost of maintenance. He knows that there's a price to earnings ratio. We talked about stocks earlier. And that if that price to earnings ratio is, I know it's higher than this probably, but 20 to one, that means every $1 he can generate, it translates to $20 in his stock price, in his value or his net worth. Well, it's very similar in the value formula. Let's take a dollar. Let's say we have a commercial property. Let's say it's a multifamily property and we can increase uh, revenue by a dollar or drop the cost by a dollar. Therefore, we increase monthly income by one dollar. Now, you're pretty good in math. One dollar a month is $12 a year, right? So $12 a year, to, again, that's the value formula. Value is an income divided by cap rate. So $12 is a numerator. The denominator is, let's say, 6% cap rate, 0 0.06. $12 by 0 0.06 is $200. You just increase the value of your multifamily by $200 just by finding $1 in increased monthly income. It's powerful, but it's even better than that because when you add leverage into the equation, it accelerates and multiplies by several times the value of that $200 to the investor. And, you know, 60% uh, leverage means 2.5x, that $200 value in the pocket of the investor could feel like $500 in their equity. So two things I'm getting from that. Number one, I, it seems like I can control the value of a building, where on the, on the house side, I can't as much. The only thing I can do there is I can pretty it up and make it look like the comps. With commercial real estate in general, though, I can actually literally force the appreciation. I don't have to uh, wait for the market to go up or anything like that by increasing the income. And number two, my, when we're listening to you, is that I don't have to do much uh, to actually increase that, that value. So what are some of the things, what are some of the simple things that an, an operator can do to, increase, to create massive value? Well, I mean, here's, here's an example that is really powerful. Um, I'm changing the numbers. I'm rounding the numbers just to make it an easy example. And so uh, our Wellings Income Fund invests in mobile home parks and self-storage. And one of our operators purchased a mobile home park. And let's say they paid $5 million for this. Now, if they leverage that at 60%, that means they got $3 million in debt, $2 million in equity, $5 million total, right? Now, they went in and they realized this mobile home park is, it's got work trailers and boats and RVs and a third or fourth or fifth or sixth car sitting in front of the trailer and we want to clean this place up. So they said, hey, we're going to pave an acre of weeds out here. We're going to put a nice fence and a gate on it and we're going to make you put all that stuff in there. And by the way, we're going to charge you for that. And so they spent $100,000 paving this acre and they're making people put their extra stuff in there. They're charging them and then they're going to go out to the community next and say, hey, we've got rental boat and RV storage, which is a huge value to people in subdivisions that aren't allowed to keep their boats or RVs in their driveway. And so when this is all leased up, Michael, it'll be $10,000 a month in added revenue and they only spent 100,000 doing it. So that's 120,000 a year. It's 120% annual ROI. That's great. But think about this, $120,000 divided by that same cap rate, remember the value formula, 120,000 by 0 0.06, that's 2 million in value. Now, they made one change and they had to spend some effort getting leased up, but this one change creates 2 million in value. That's 40% increase to the $5 million value. But think about this, the equity was only $2 million. 
You just added two million to that. You doubled the value of the investor equity with one change. And that doesn't include the dozen other things they could do to drive income and potentially even compress the cap rate at that property. That's amazing. So an operator doesn't have to do a whole lot to really achieve a lot of, a lot of value. Uh, we don't have to be geniuses, really. Uh, right. A lot of times, and especially on a multifamily side, it's just a matter of putting a professional manager in place. Like, for example, right. we'll buy a property, you'll look at a property, and it's, it's self-managed or pseudo-self-managed, and they're not doing a whole bunch of things that are for relatively common sense, like raise your rents to market, you know, turn over units, make a repair every once in a while. Right. And so these, these, these uh, apartment buildings are underperforming based on the one maybe next door. So, so the one thing that we can do very simply is just put a professional manager in place. And just by doing that, it literally doubles the value of the equity invested. So it's not like this, this magical thing and we have to be like geniuses at all. It's like, it's like really repeatable, really, really predictable. Right. Yeah, it's very, very powerful. And that, that's an example of increasing the income. We can also talk about how to compress the cap rate if you like. No, how do you do that? So it's not always as easy to compress the cap rate. It's, it's based on some more external factors. But I know a self-storage operator who goes in and he buys, there's a lot, there are 53,000 self-storage facilities in the U.S. About 40,000 are run by independent operators and a lot of them are mom and pops. Some of them are in the path of progress, places like Marietta, Georgia, or places like, you know, west of Dulles. Virginia, where there, you know, might be a self-storage operation that was there since the 80s, but it used to be farmland, and now it's really grown up in the area. Well, that mom and pop operator doesn't know or care to drive income, but they also don't care to professionalize the operation. So an operator like we invest with, they might go in and buy, say, five of these in an area, and they bring the income up, they make them into a franchise-like operation, they standardize everything, they might add more square footage to some vacant land that comes with the property. And by doing that, they can put together a portfolio of assets and they can sell this portfolio to a REIT. Now a REIT is looking typically for not a lot of drama, not a lot of value add, not a lot of buildings to build. They're looking for steady, stable income and they're willing to pay more for that. In other words, they're willing to pay a lower at a lower cap rate. If you can compress the cap rate from 7%, let's say when you buy it from the mom and pop, to 5.5% cap rate, that may seem like a small change. Let's say you don't touch the income at all, the numerator, but the denominator you compress from 7 to 5.5. Okay, that's about a 25, 27% increase in value just by changing the cap rate, just by finding the right buyer in this case. But if you leverage that, Let's say you have 70% loan to value on that. You multiply that number by three. So if it's 25%, let's say, increase in value, the equity goes up by 3x or about 75% just from finding this right buyer. Pretty powerful. That is powerful. We see something similar on the multifamily side. Uh, yeah. For example, if you do a, a very heavy renovation, you might lift a property from, you know, C plus to maybe a B type uh, property. And uh, and as you know, the higher the class, class B, class A cap rates are, are typically lower. So we can find that on a he on a heavy value add deal that the cap rate upon refinance or resale is lower than we bought it. Now we don't normally plan for this kind of thing, right. but we see it all all the time, especially if you do a refinance versus a sale. So a sale, you know, the cap rates tend to be maybe a little higher, uh, but refinance, the cap rates are always a little bit lower. So the valuation is always a little, a little higher, which is, which is really right. cool. But the bottom line is this, and people don't quite understand this because it's, it doesn't happen on the residential side, is you do, the lever is huge, right? You do a little bit on one end and the impact on the other is just, it's just so massive. Right. And, and it seems like magic, but it's really not. And, and, and it's relatively easy to do. And it, it's just unbelievable. And, and it also adds that predictability. And I think that this is the one thing that frustrates everyone about the stock market is I can't predict what's going to happen. How can I do financial planning when I don't know what's going to happen 10, 15, 20 years? I, I can't make, I can create spreadsheets all I want, but the probability of hitting that is who knows, right? right? So someone, someone looking to kind of get into this, what are some of their considerations are going, huh, okay, this is interesting. You know, what they, should they be thinking about? What's kind of their next steps? 
So one reason, you know, so I, I believe, and I looked over the Forbes 400 list, and I, I, I believe that almost all of the Forbes 400 either made their money in commercial real estate or they perpetuate it. They invest in commercial real estate. Now, the problem, Michael, is, and you and I knew this years ago, and that is that the barriers to entry are very high. You've got to have experience to convince a broker or lender that they should loan or sell to you. You've got to have a high net worth. You've got to have high liquidity. You've got to have a team, or you better, if you're going to operate this. And so the barriers to entry are real high. The great news is that uh, through the crowdfunding, the Jobs Act of 2013, and other things, uh, there have been a lot of syndicators that have risen up, or funds like ours that have risen up, allowing investors to access this, and they can invest passively, and they can enjoy the value formula, the predictability, the stability, the potential growth of multifamily, self-storage, mobile home parks, et cetera, and the amazing tax advantages. I did a webinar last night on 10 surprising tax advantages that commercial real estate and investors enjoy, and we recorded that on April 15th, and we said, you know, a lot of commercial real estate investors are smiling today while a lot of America frowns and mourns. Yes, it was a sad day for many and a very happy day. But let's talk about that on that point because some people don't know about the tax advantages. And, and it, uh, commercial real estate is such an extraordinary asset class. Uh, what are the tax advantages of commercial real estate? Well, I mean, one is the depreciation. So um, you can accelerate depreciation with a cost segregation study. And, and what that means is this, a building uh, a, a, let's say a multifamily, it's got, let's say 20, 25, 30% in the land, and then it's got 75% or so in the building. And if you ran that over a 27 and a half year depreciation straight line, you would be able to deduct a certain amount per year. Yay, that's fine. But if you do a cost segregation study, um, that allows you to break the value of the building into components. The components would be things that would be able to be depreciated sooner. For example, the parking lot, the stripes, the paving, the shrubbery, uh, the out outdoor electrical stuff. Uh, a lot of that can be depreciated. Roofs can be depreciated over, say, 15 years. Uh, internally, you know, there's lighting, electrical, cabinets, countertops, carpet, paint that can be depreciated over, let's say, five years. And by accelerating the depreciation, investors get a chance to have a check in their mailbox or in their bank account every quarter, but they're actually getting a loss on their K-1 every year for a long time. And this is powerful. Now, that's one of the reasons I recommend people invest directly in real estate so they're getting a K-1 and they're getting the advantage of, you know, these type of deductions from depreciation. There's also something called bonus depreciation. Now, Section 179 of the IRS Code, it, you know, love him or hate him, the guy in the White House, he has a commercial real estate investing background, and the, the new tax law has given us a, an ability to write off up to, I think it's a million dollars of things like roofs, et cetera, in the year that they're done rather than depreciating that over 15 years. If you can write off a million dollars and have a million dollar loss on your K-1 uh, in a certain year, you can carry that forward for a long, long time. There's all kinds of other things you can do as well, like becoming a QREP, Qualified Real Estate uh, Professional, that allows you to write off much more instead of carrying that out uh, as far into the future. There's all kinds of other things as well. So let me get this straight, just sort of sinking into the, to the listeners, because let's say you invest $100,000 and you get $10,000 back, back in, in cash flow, right? Now, in the stock world, you would have to pay taxes on that, uh, short-term, long-term capital gain, but not in real estate because of this magical thing called depreciation. And so what happens is, long story short, right, is on your K-1, which is a statement that investors get that says, hey, you actually made this money in this particular investment, instead of showing a $10,000 loss, it, uh, a gain, it might show like, I don't know, a $10,000 loss. Yeah. And so now, if you can't use that loss, you can carry it forward the next year, and next year, and next year. And, right. and, and so now, the probability that you're paying taxes on anything is like close to zero. That's crazy. Yeah, it's really powerful. You can write off $3,000 a year, from what I understand, unless you're a qualified real estate professional, then you can write off much more, possibly all of it. 
Yeah, that's that's uh, that's amazing. That's cool. So tell us a little bit about Wellings Capital. What are you guys doing right now? What kind of assets you're looking at, uh, and what's your strategy moving forward? Well, we've had a really hard time. You know, we um, we missed the boat. You know, Michael, you were talking about uh, places like Memphis and some other places that I was a little bit nervous about, and you guys killed it, and we did not. And so Wellings Capital. We were honestly doing a great job of acquisitions. We're all in our 50s. We all fairly conservative. And so we were kind of waiting for the market to soften for a number of years, which it really hasn't. And so we decided to expand out into self-storage and mobile home parks. And when we learned how to do that and we learned on paper how to make those mechanics work, we were really excited. But we realized, eh, you know, we don't have a track record in this. And we're not really excited about taking millions of dollars from investors to do something that we know how to do, but we haven't done. We don't have a team to do it. So we decided to partner with other operators. And so we are partnering with a few great operators in self-storage, mobile home parks, potentially multifamily. And we are uh, looking to invest with them. We bring the equity. They get the debt. They find the deal. And we're uh, giving our investors access to their deals. We're giving them the capital to expand. And uh, so far, it's going great. We've got two funds. We've got the Wellings Income Fund One, and that is an income and growth fund. We're targeting 15% total annual return. That's evenly split between uh, annual income, annual distributions, and uh, growth. And then we've got a growth fund where we're doing ground up development or really steep value adds. And that is a little higher risk, but we're expecting a total return. We're targeting a total return of 19% or more in the Wellings Growth Fund. That's awesome. Paul, how do people find you, connect with you? They can find my website. It's wellingscapital.com. That's W-E-L-L-I-N-G-S, capital.com. They can find our uh, How to Lose Money podcast, which we've been honored to have you as a guest on twice, I think. And uh, they can find me on Bigger Pockets as well. That's awesome. And uh, you also have a fabulous book out called The Perfect Investment. It really kind of goes deep on some of the arguments here about why multifamily and commercial real estate in general is so awesome. So if you guys haven't read that yet, it's on Amazon, The Perfect Investment. Paul, thank you so much for being on the show. It was, it was really, really fun. Yeah, Michael, I really enjoyed it. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Paul always has so much stuff to teach and learn from. It's unbelievable. So I hope you got some mindset, some insight into the mindset of the high net worth individual. If you're passively, uh, considering passively investing and you're kind of struggling with the stock market a little bit, then really consider passively investing in multifamily. If you're an active uh, investor or you want to be an active investor, then really think about what the passive investors are going through, right? I mean, they're, they're kind of struggling with the entire stock market, you know, the, the unpredictability and the volatility thereof. And so uh, uh, really understanding what they're going through and then presenting opportunities to invest with you and they're going to be glad that you talk to them as well so again for you guys for uh, if you want if you're interested in passively investing in multifamily the what I love about it is, is several things one is the predictability and consistency of it so, so in other words there's no ups and downs with with the stock market there's a compounded return and I really love the way that multifamily performed in the last recession uh, for example, single-family houses defaulted, 4% of them defaulted in 2007, 8, 9, and only 04 in multifamily. It was extremely, extremely solid uh, performance of multifamily, and the returns are, are pretty phenomenal. The above average returns, right? So we're, we're seeing returns of between 10 and 15% average annual returns, and multifamily uh, has cash flow, right? Stocks don't really have cash flow unless you're selling puts and calls, which is a really advanced strategy. You have cash flow coming in, which is outstanding. Uh, and the tax advantages, as we talked about on the show, are really, really phenomenal. I mean, they're extraordinary. You need to like, you need to read Tom Wheelwright's book. Tom Wheelwright uh, um, has a book out, and he's a CPA, and he talks about the, the tax benefits of of multifamily real estate. You got to read this because it will, it's incredible. It'll, it'll boost your returns far, far above what you might be able to imagine. So, we also do deals, and we're constantly partnering with uh, with investors. So if that you think it might be interested, our investment company is called Nighthawk Equity. Go to nighthawkequity.com. We again have a, a, a whole bunch of free resources. We have FAQs and other learning resources. And if you're interested in receiving uh, opportunities from us, just join our investment club. It's a Nighthawk Investment Club. Just click the Join button, nighthawkequity.com. 
and uh, that will prompt us to have a conversation. We'll get to know each other a little bit, and uh, we'll be able to present you with some upcoming opportunities. So that's NighthawkEquity.com. And again, whether you're an active or passive investor, make sure you uh, join us in DealMaker Live in Dallas, July 26, 27, and that's at TheMichaelBlanc.com forward slash event. All right, guys, hope you enjoyed that. Uh, take care. Catch you on the next episode. All right, I hope you enjoyed that. Now, the next step, download this ebook right here. Okay, when you've downloaded that, uh, make sure you also subscribe to my YouTube channel because then you can get all of the videos that I release as soon as I release. So make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel right now. Click on that right now. And then also make sure that this is the next best video to watch is this one right here. So hope you enjoy that. I'll catch you next time.